Assalamu alaikum dear students This is comedy of manners for the BS MSSX and the course code is EMGL3124 and the topic header gatherers act 1 text with explanation and I'm your instructor Sabah Today's lecture is about Hedda Gabler, a very well-known play. Hedda Gabler is written by Hendrik John Ibsen, a Norwegian playwright and theatre director as well. He is one of the founders of modernism in theatre. In fact, Ibsen is often referred to as the father of realism and one of the most influential playwrights of his time. As this discussion is about the first act of the play, text along with the critical commentary. So before starting the text, let's have a look. The characters, those are the part of this play in Hedda Gabler by Henrik Ebsen. So first character is Hedda Gabler. Hedda Gabler is the daughter of a famous general Gabler. As a child, she was used to enjoy luxury and high class living so as the play began she is returning from her honeymoon with Jagan Tespin a scholar with good opportunities but not as much money as Hedda is accustomed to so her married name in the play is Hedda Tespin she is intelligent unpredictable and somewhat dishonest young woman who is not afraid of manipulating others for her own personal benefits. Second character in the play is Jervin Tesman. As I already mentioned that Mr. Tes Jervin Tesman is the man to whom he had a Gabriel married. So Tesman is a caring, loving as well as intelligent young scholar. And he tries very hard to please everyone in his life, especially his wife, Hedda. And he, most often he realizes that he, that she is manipulating him. In fact, he often seems foolish for his age. And when he annoys Hedda, we also have a reason to sympathize with him and her as well. So Tesman is hoping to have a professorship in history um, in the beginning of the play. And he is a man who was orphaned and raised by her, by his aunt. So the third most important character in the play is Judge Black. Judge Black is a family friend. And he is a judge of relatively inferior rank. He is a friend of both Tesman and Hedda as well. And he visits their house regularly. He has connections around the town and is often, he is the first to give Tesman information about alteration and suggestions in the possibility of his professorship. He seems to enjoy meddling in other people's affairs and he is very worldly and very sharp minded man. Another important character in the play is Julian Tesman. Julian Tesman or Aunt Julie is the aunt of Jack and Tesman. After Tesman's parents died, Aunt Judy raised him. She is well meaning and she is constantly hinting that that they must have a kind of good family relationship. And she is actually a woman who is all the time trying to please others in order to find her own purpose of life in caring others. Another important character in the play is Isle Clubbaugh. He is a genius and he is also a biggest rival and competitor of Mr. Tesman as well in his academic world. So after a series of scandals related to drinking, uh, he was once public outcast but now as the play will begin, he is returning to the city and he is going to publish a book and he has also another script with him 
who is going to be more promising there is a lady the other character in the play mrs lister she is actually helping him in making all these things to happen mrs lister is also once upon a time was schoolmate of the main character protagonist of the play had a gambler and she is also a rival at the time as the play will begin so another character in the play is bur or berta she is housemaid and once she was serving miss julian tesman and now she is going to be a housemaid for miss hada gabler last character in the play is aunt rena and she never appears on the stage but she is constantly the part of conversation among the characters in the play so as we have discussed about the characters let's start with the text text first before starting the text it's important to make you understand few things so that you may understand the text appropriately and also can enjoy the taste also able to understand what the writer wants to convey through these descriptions act 1 start as this is generally a tradition in writing a drama or play that you always start with the description of the things mostly so it's also very important as i mentioned earlier in the beginning that this play is written by a realist uh, henry ibsen ibsen is known as a revolutionary a symbolist a feminist a naturalist but most importantly he is known as a realist so this description will also give us an idea of his realism as this description is also very important in the beginning of the play because the whole play all the acts all the incidents and events of the play will take place over here so all the things are described in details and this gives us an idea of ibsen's art of detailing things as he is very well known for describing minute details so that we may connect with the mind and the minute details of the characters acts as well as their thoughts so let's have a start with the text first so the setting is a spacious handsome and tastefully furnished drawing room decorated in dark colors in the back a wide doorway with curtain drawn back leading into a smaller room decorated in the same style as the drawing room in the right hand wall of the front room a folding door leading out to the hall in the opposite wall on the left a glass door also with curtain drawn back so through the pans can be seen a part of veranda outside and trees covered with autumn foliage and over table with cover on it and surrounded by chairs stands well forward now just notice how careful he is even in the description of the furniture even in the description of the uh, room details this is tesman's villa or the newly uh, built house for hada so he is describing tesman's house with the details so from this we are going to enter in character's life with the dialogues as we are going to be introduced to the first character here julian a testman with a bond on a on a carrying a parasol comes in from the hall followed by perta who carry the bouquet wrapped in a paper miss testman is calmly and pleasant looking lady of about 65 she is nicely but simply dressed in a gray walking costume Berta is a middle-aged woman of plain and rather countrified appearance. Ibsen's art of describing characters is apparent here. In fact, this is the quality of realist writers that they do not involve all their craftsmanship into describing their characters. They just describe their characters by dialogues. With the appearance, and then leave the perceptions in the part of the reader, how they are going to image a specific personality in their mind, 
and how they are going to connect those characters with the incidents or the happenings of the play. So, Miss Desmond, we are going to be introduced with a lady who is calmly and pleasant looking and she is of 65. She is nicely but simply dressed. She is not that much elegant as we are expecting her. And Berta is a middle-aged woman of plain and rather contrified appearance. Both are the experienced ladies in age and experiences. So the first dialogue, Miss Tessman or Juliana Tessman stops close to the door, listens and says softly, Upon my word, I do not leave this stirring yet. Berta, also softly, I told you so, Miss. Remember how late the steamboat caught in last night. And then when they got home, good lord, what a lord the young mistress had to unpack before she could get to bed. So from here, we are getting a taste of description of the characters by Ibsen. The main protagonist of the story is not being introduced by using a proper description before her arrival. We are being introduced about the personality by the comments. Those are being discussed in the play by the other characters or in the situation by other characters. So from here we can say that he is similar to, uh, Ibsen is similar to a little bit of Hardian style the way he explained things and he is little bit affected or having a strong impact of the Victorian era descriptions uh, of describing details about the characters. Miss Tessman, well, well, let them have their sleep out, but let us see that they get a good breath of the fresh morning air. When they do appear, she goes to the glass door and throws it open. Berta beside the table, at a loss, what to do with a bouquet in her hand. I declare there isn't a bit of room left. I think I'll put it down here, miss. She places it on the piano. Miss Tessman, so you have got a new mistress now, my dear Berta. Heaven knows it was a night to me to part with you. Berta on the point of weeping. And do you think it was not hard for me to miss? After all the blessed years, I have been with you and Miss Rena. The conversation between these two characters gives us the feeling of a close family bonding even with a housemate. Miss Tessman is all love and care for the other characters. Throughout the play, we found her a very loving, caring, always trying to please others so here also she gives us a feeling that she is feeling a little bit disturbed as her housemate is going to be departed from the previous house where they were living together and now she is shifted to a new house where miss hada is going to be the landlady so same is the case with the housemaid as she was treated well by the landlady uh, uh, Miss Tessman, she also has a feeling of disturbance and she says it's also hard for me how to remain alone and how to go on without being the part of Miss Rena's and Aunt Julia's house. Miss Tessman, we must make the best of it, Berta. There was nothing else to be done. George cannot do without you. You see, he absolutely can't. He has had you to look after him ever since he was a little boy. So, we are being told by the writer through the dialogues that George Tessman is actually raised by in a house where, where these ladies were living. So, but uh, Miss Julia, they cannot help thinking of Miss Rena lying helpless at home there poor thing and with only that new girl too. She'll never learn to take proper care of any new valid. <laughs> Miss Tessman, oh, I shall manage to train her. And of course, you know, I shall take most of it upon myself. 
her sacrificing nature is apparent everywhere. In all the dialogues, in the beginning, even till the end of the play, she is always accommodating, adjusting with others for making compromises to make other people's life more easier and happy. You need not to be uneasy about my poor sister, my dear Berta. Berta, well, but there is another thing is, I'm so mortally afraid. I shouldn't be able to soothe the young mistress, Miss Desmond. Oh, well, just at first, there may be one or two things, but uh, most likely she'll be terribly grand, terrible grand in her ways. So, Hedda is introduced as uh, that the, housemaid, the, the housemaid is mortally afraid. And she feels that the lady who is terribly grand in her ways, how she's going to be the part of her home. And it would not be easy to entertain Hedda. Miss Desmond, well, you cannot wonder at that. General Gabler's daughter, think of the sort of life she was accustomed to in her father's time. Don't you remember how we used to see her riding down the road along with the general? in that long black habit. So, uh, we are given the idea that Hedda was enjoying a life that was different from the life of the women of that time. Because in the previous lecture, I told the social and historical background of this play that what sort of the women life was there when they were not given any rights. They do not enjoy that sort of the freedom as the women of the day can enjoy. So from that specific society, even Hedda was having a more blessed life as compared to the other women. So Berta, yes indeed I remember well enough, but good lord, I should never have dreamt in those days that she and Master George would make a match of it. Now from this onward we can guess and we can predict that this marriage is a little bit not suitable and it's improbable. Miss Desmond, nor I, but by the by, Berta, while I think of it in future, you must not say Master George. You must say Dr. Desmond. Berta, yes, the young mistress spoke of that too last night, the moment they set foot in the house. Is it true then? Miss Desmond, yes, indeed it is. Only thing, Berta, some foreign university has made him a doctor. While he has been abroad, you understand, I hadn't heard a word about it. Until he told me himself, Berta, well, well, he is clever enough for anything he is. But I didn't think he would have gone for doctoring people. Mr. Desmond, no, no, it's not that sort of doctor he is. She knows significantly. But let me tell you, we may have to call him something still grander before long. Berta, you do not say so, but... Can that be, Miss? Miss Desmond, smiling. Hmm, wouldn't you like to know with emotion? Ah, dear, dear, if my poor brother could only look up from his grave now and see what his little boy has grown into, looks around. But bless me, Berta, why have you done this? Taken the chins covered off all the furniture? From this conversation, we perceive the, uh, we perceive the notion that Desmond was living with his aunt and he is often having no father, no mother and Miss Desmond raised him and she sacrificed her whole life as we are not uh, aware till now any kind of reference or hint towards her own life uh, or any kind of kids, family and marriage. She is all the time talking about Desmond and her invalid sister. Rina. Berta, the mistress told me too, she cannot abide covers on the chairs, she says. Miss Desmond, are they going to make this their everyday sitting room then? Berta, yes, that's what I understood from the mistress. Master George, the doctor, has said nothing. From here onward, the first male character in the play, also a very important entry, um, is introduced and he comes and let's have a look uh, on the description that how he is being introduced by the writer to us. George Desmond comes from the right into the inner room, coming to himself, 
and carrying an unstrapped amputee for man two. He is a middle-sized, young-looking man of 33, rather stout with a round, open, cheerful face, fair hair and beard. He wears spectacles and is somewhat carelessly dressed in uncomfortable uncom in indoor clothes. Miss Desmond, good morning, good morning, George. Desmond in the doorway between the room. Aunt Julia, dear Aunt Julia, goes up to her and shakes hands warmly. Come all this way so ugly. Miss Desmond, why, of course, I had to come and see how you were getting on. The level of frankness and the level of attachment and the closeness between these two characters hints towards a close family bonding that actually, that actually Hedda is afraid of. They both, Mr. Desmond and Juliana Desmond, they make a family and this familial relationship is very much obvious in all these dialogues as he says, Aunt Julia, dear Aunt Julia, and then he shakes hands warmly and he's so excited to see her as well as Miss Desmond cannot wait even for the day to um, a day afternoon or evening she just come and visit his house and she was very eager to see him after a long time to talk to him after a long time so Tasman in spite of your having her no proper night rest she doesn't even care about her rest at the age of 65 she comes early in the morning with all the bouquets with all the flowers to welcome the newlywed couple. So Miss Tessman, oh that makes no difference to me. This dialogue that makes no difference to me is very really important as wherever she is, wherever in, in all type of the situations as those are going to be unfolded soon as we will go on with the text, nothing makes difference to her. She is so flexible and she is desperately flexible in adjusting herself with others, with caring others. In fact, she hints towards the type of women those were present at Hedda's time. All that time prioritizing the needs of others, caring for men, thinking about them, dreaming about a home life, all that time sacrificing their own needs to adjust with others, especially the men of their life. So Hedda is opposite to all this. So she is sacrificing her time, her excitement, her moments just in order to spend for Mr. Tesman or in fact to make him happy. Tesman, well I suppose you got home all right from Pare, Miss Tesman, yes quite safely, thank goodness. Judge Bragg was good enough to see me right to my door. Tesman, we were so sorry, we couldn't give you a seat in the carriage. Well, you saw what a pile of boxes Hedda had to bring with her. So, Miss Tesman replies, Yes, she has certainly plenty of boxes. Berta to Tesman, shall I go in and see if there is anything I can do for the mistress? Tesman, no, thank you, Berta, you need not. She said she would ring if she wanted anything. Berta, going towards the right, very well. Tesman, but look there, take this for man too. With you, Berta taking it, okay, I'll put it in that day. So, the previous dialogue that Miss Tesman was talking about, that how much dependent your Tesman is, and how confidentially he hands over his luggage to housemaid and housemaid herself decides to place it. She goes out by the hall door. Tesman, fancy auntie, I had the whole of that box full of copies of the documents. You wouldn't believe how much I have picked up from all the archives I have been examining. Curious old details that no one has had any idea of. So the tone of the dialogue is a little bit ironical a little bit different. In fact, it's a bit funny as well that a man uh, coming from his house, his honeymoon trip after six months and the first comment that he made to Aunt 
Julie was about his scholarly concerns. It was about the books, it was about the documents and it was about the search. So it gives an idea that what sort of the time he was spending when he was on his spring tour. Mr. Esmond, yes, you do not seem to have wasted your time on your wedding trip, George. Mr. Esmond, no, that I haven't. But do take off your bonnet, Auntie. Look here, let me untie the strings. Mr. Esmond, while he does so well, well, this is just as if you were still at home with us. So, <clears throat> the, uh, they are very um, homely and close to each other. That Esmond's concerns about auntie is apparent in his behavior towards her and Miss Tessman feeling more nostalgic that she feels that it seems as if that you are living with us. The same sort of the care, the same sort of love, uh, the passion is very obvious. Tessman with the bonnet in her hand looks at it from all sides. Why? What a gorgeous bonnet you have an interesting in. Miss Tessman, I bought it on Hedda's account. Tessman, on Hedda's account? Miss Tessman, yes, so that Hedda need not to be ashamed of me. We happen to go out together. Hinting towards, now Miss Tessman is hinting towards that social class difference between Hedda and Tessman's family. Tessman patting her cheeks. You always think of everything, Aunt Julia. And now, look here. Suppose we sit comfortably on the sofa and have a little chat till Hedda comes. They seat themselves. She places her parasol in the corner. Miss Tessman takes both his hand and looks at him. What a delight it is to have you again, as large as life. Before my very eye, George, my George, my poor brother's own son. Tessman, and it is a delight for me to see, to see you again, Aunt Julia, you who have been father and mother in one to me. Miss Tessman, oh yes, I know you will always keep a place in your heart for your own aunts. Tessman, and what about Aunt Rena? No improvement. Miss Tessman, oh no, we can scarcely look for any improvement in her case. Poor thing, there she lies, helpless. As she has lived for all the years, but heaven grant I may not lose her yet a while, for if I did, I do not know what I should make of my life. George, especially now that I haven't you to look after any, look after any more. Miss Tessman, as I already told you, always trying to find purpose of her life in caring others. If she is caring George Tessman, an orphan, she has a purpose of her life. If she is taking care of her invalid sister, she's also having a kind of activity in life. So. It becomes more like a matter of prestige to be present, to be important. What we are feeling very closely in the dialogues of Miss Tessman. Tessman patting her back, there, there, there. Miss Tessman suddenly changing her tone. And to think that here are you, a married man, George. Now she has her own concerns. In fact, we can say these are the fears that she has. And that you should be the one to carry off Hedda Gabler, the beautiful Hedda Gabler. Only think of it, she that was so beset with admirers. Tessman hums a little and smiles complacently. Yes, I fancy I have several good friends about town who would like to stand in my shoes. Miss Desmond, and then this fine long magic tour you have had more than five, nearly six months. Desmond, well, for me, it has been a sort of tour of research as well. I have had to do so much grubbing among the old records and to read no end of books to Auntie. Miss Desmond, oh, yeah, I suppose so, more confidentially, and lowering her voice a little. But listen now, George, have you nothing, nothing special? to tell me, Tessman, as to our journey, 
Yes, Desmond, yes. Desmond, no, I do not know of anything except what I have told you in my letters. I had a doctor's degree conferred on me for that I told you yesterday. Miss Desmond, yes, yes, you did. But what I mean is, haven't you any, any expectations? A typical household conversation between two house-friendly people. Desmond, well, you see my handsome traveling scholarship went a good way. Miss Desmond, but I cannot understand how you can have made it go for enough for two. Desmond, no, that's not easy to understand. Miss Desmond, especially traveling with a lady, they tell me that makes it ever so much more expensive. So, till now, at this point of the play, the main character is not yet appeared on stage, but we are getting a level of understanding and familiarity with her personality. She is adorable, she is confident, she is vibrant, she is expensive, she is not easy to handle, she is enthusiastic and she is making, she has many admirers. It's not easy to be uh, the man of such sort of a woman. And then the married with the marriage trip. All these things gives us a very interesting description of the character. And I think so. We all are, and everyone who is reading the play, feels more and more excited that when Hada is coming on screen or stage, to, so that we may look at her, so that we may connect all these um, positive or negative comments or compliments with the personality and to judge her with her own perceptions. So, uh, Desmond says, yes, of course, it makes it a little more expensive, but had I had to have this trip, auntie, she really had to. Nothing else would have done. Miss Desmond, no, no, I suppose not. A wedding tour seems to be quite indispensable nowadays. But tell me now, have you gone thoroughly over the house yet? Desmond, yes, you may be sure I have. I have been a uh, foot ever since daylight. Miss Desmond. Yes, it was lucky that this very house should come into the market just after you have started. Desmond, yes, Aunt Julia, the luck was on our side, wasn't it? Miss Desmond, but the expense, my dear John, you will find it very expensive. All this. Now, this luck is uh, the, about this luck, he is talking about Hedas as a wife and his chance to become a professor, his um, success in buying a new house, um, uh, one of the very uh, favorite houses that, she had, uh, that Hedda wants to live in. Desmond looks, uh, looks at her, a little cast down, yes, I suppose, I shall aunt. Miss Desmond, oh, correctly. Desmond, how much do you think in round numbers? Miss Desmond, oh, I cannot even guess until all the firms come in. Desmond, well, fortunately, Judge Black has secured the most favorable terms for me, so he said in the letter to Hedda. So all this talk is about the, the dialogues between these two characters, Desmond and Miss Desmond, is about um, their expenses, their concerns about money uh, and this shows their social status and value. So, Miss Tresman, I have given a mortgage on her aunt. Tresman jumps up. What, on your and Aunt Rina's? Miss Tresman, yes, I knew of no other plan, you see. Tresman placing himself before I have you gone out of your senses, aunt, it's all that you and Aunt Rina have to live upon. Miss Tessman, Auntie Juliana Tessman, is at the extremes to please Mr. Tessman. She in fact invested everything of her life, her time, her money, her savings, just in order to make Mr. Tessman's life happy. And this is what that actually, the type of sentimental women of the time are. And Hedda is different women of all these sort of the things. Miss Desmond, well, well, 
Don't get so excited about it. It's only a matter of form, you know. Judge Bragg assured me of that. It was he that was kind enough to arrange the whole affair for me. A mere matter of form, he said. Tells me, yes, that may be all very well, but nevertheless, Mr. Pressman, you will have your own salary to depend upon now. And good heavens, even if we did have to pay up a little, trick things out of it at the start. Why, it would be nothing but a pleasure to us. Yes, my old auntie, will you never be tired of making sacrifices for me? Miss Desmond rises and lays her hand on his shoulders. Have I any other happiness in the world except to smooth your way for you? My dear boy, you who have had neither father nor mother to depend on, and now we have reached the goal, George. Things have looked black enough for us sometime, but thank heaven, now you have nothing to fear. Desmond, yes, it's really marvelous how everything has turned out for the best. Definitely, her efforts for making Desmond's life better and smoother one are fruitful now. He is a doctor, married to a very um, beautiful, adorable, well settled, well known woman of the time, and he is going to have a good job and soon in future buying a new house. So things are all well and going well in the life of Desmond's family. And the people who opposed you, who wanted to bar the way you are, now you have them at your feet. They have fallen, George, your most dangerous rival, his fault was the worst. And now he has to lie on the bed he has made for himself. Poor misguided creature. Desmond, have you heard anything of other since I went away? I mean, Miss Desmond, only that he is said to have published a new book. Desmond, what? I little up Bob recently. Miss Desmond, yes, so they say, have a note whether it can be worth anything and when your new book appears. That will be another story, George, what it is to be about. Desmond, talking about the new book that is coming in market very soon, um, and, the, and the, this is the same book from which he was working in his honeymoon trip. Desmond, I will deal with the domestic industries of Bourbon during the Middle Ages, so he talks about the topic. Miss Desmond fancy to be able to write on such a subject as that. Now, she is full of appreciation for Mr. Desmond all the time. Desmond, however, it may be some time before the book is ready. I have all these collections to arrange first, you see. Miss Desmond, yes, collecting and arranging. No one can reach you at that. There you are, my poor brother's own son. Desmond, I am looking forward eagerly to setting to work at it. Especially now that I have my own delightful home to work in. Miss Desmond, most of all, now that you have got the wife of your heart, my dear George Desmond, embracing her. Oh, yes, yes, Aunt Julia. Hedda, she is the best part of it all. I believe I hear her coming. Hedda enters from the left through the inner room. Her face and figure show refinement and distinction. Her complexion is pale and opaque. Her steel gray eyes express a cold, unruffled repose. Her hair is of an agreeable brown, but not particularly mundane. She is dressed in a tasteful, somewhat loose fitting morning gown. Miss Desmond, going to meet Hedda. Good morning, my dear Hedda. Good morning, and a hearty welcome. She is as excited to see her as she was excited to see Mr. Desmond. So Hedda holds out her hand. Good morning, dear Miss Desmond. So early at one. That is kind of you. Now she is ironical at the same time. She is criticizing her. And she is making things in a way that Miss... In fact, she wants to make them realize that things are different in her world as compared to their world. Miss Desmond, with some sort of embarrassment. Well, has the bride slept well in her new home? Hedda, oh yes, thank Pessimilly. Desmond laughing Pessimilly. Come, that's good, Hedda. You were sleeping like a stone when I got you. Fortunately, of course, one has always to custom oneself to new surroundings, Miss Desmond. Little by little, looking towards the left, oh, there is servant has gone and opened the veranda door and let in a whole flood of sunshine. Now, 
the morning light in the beginning in the description of the setting and then the fresh morning air that Ms. Tesman was hoping for for the new bride and Hedda's response, she is always opposite what the others are doing and this being this, uh, having this opposite personality is actually the reason of her cynical behavior a little bit showing a level of anxiety and depression in her personality. So Ms. Tesman going towards the door, well then we will shut it. Now she is all time all, as I told again and again, that she is all time the typical type of the woman of that era, all time adjusting herself, all time ready to sacrifice her own choices, her own preferences for others, just in order to make them happy. So I don't know, no, not that, Tesman. Please draw the curtain, that will give a softer light. It can be a symbol, on symbolic grounds, it can be Hedda's conscious effort to refrain herself from the happening, those are there in the house. And in fact, it's a choice strategy of her personality not to show her true self to the other. So that's why she doesn't want to be in light. So Tesman at the door, all right, all right, there now, Hedda. Now you have both shade and fresh air. Hedda, yes, fresh air we certainly must have with all these stacks of flowers. But won't you sit down, Miss Tesman? Miss Tesman, no, thank you. Now that I have seen it, everything is all right here. Thanks, Evan. I must be getting off again. My sister is lying long for me, morning. Give her my best love, auntie, and say I shall look in and these, uh, and see her later in the day. Miss Tesman, yes, yes, I'll be sure to tell her, but by the by, George, feeling her dress pocket. I had almost forgotten I have something for you here. Tesman, what it is, auntie? Miss Tesman produces a flat purse wrapped in newspaper and hands it to him. Look here, my dear boy, Tesman, opening the purse. Well, I declare. Have you really saved them for me, Aunt Julia? Hedda isn't this touching. Hedda beside the footnote on the right. Well, what it is? Tesman, my old morning shoes, my slippers. From here we can understand a shift in the subject, or in fact, this is a broad device used by Ibsen. And he used it very sharply and with a clean touch that we are not feeling a sense of being deviated and he is very diversified in his um, choices. So here we are moving with the characters towards the journey of Mr. Tesman's past and his love for the old things, his love for the family warning, his, the love for his uh, personal belongings and his choices and preferences. So let's move on with the discussion and let's have a different look on Hedda's character that what sort of the responses she has for the family, for the family relations, for the old things and for the things those are not actually her choice.